For as the father had what? So had he given to Oh, you see there. To what? Not the child. To the son to have life in himself. Now, and had given him authority to execute judgment also. Why? Because he is the son of man. Now, the son of man there was not the title of Jesus. The son of man there was the legality of rights as to execution in the earth. The earth has he given to the sons of men. Do you understand it? But the authority to take on the earth for a man who has made choice in God comes by reason of the life of the father now resident in the son. That's not too much, right? Do I need to say that again? You people should be answering me. Or the, what, what I'm asking is in English. Do I need to say that again? Okay, a few years. So I'll take it again. Listen. So I said, because he's the son of man, it's not the title of Jesus. Because you know, Jesus called himself the son of man a lot. And so sometimes when you read these scriptures, you are thinking that the son of man is a title. Go and check everywhere Jesus called himself the son of man. He spoke about it as in the right to establish or execute the kingdom on earth on behalf of the father. Right? So when the Bible says the son of man here, what it meant is that by the legality of the principles of God, did I say on Sunday that the Bible says God exalts his word or principles above his name or power. Now, that means in power, God is limitless. But his principle limits his power. If you study the New Testament, you'll find out that power is always in the name. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and has given him that is that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven on earth and beneath the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus ah all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me go in my name do you understand it so where is power resident in the name but principle is resident in the word so when God sets a principle, his principle becomes the limitation for the execution of his power. If not, God does not need patience or self-control or long-suffering. He would have been executing his will immediately with no question. The earth should have taught you that lesson. If the earth has not, Nigerian politics should have. It will have taught you that the will of God does not always come to pass. On earth, what comes to pass is the will of men. The will of God comes to pass when God bequeaths authority to the sons of God. That means when the will of God is not coming to pass within the context of a generation, what is lacking is that the father lacks sons whose stature he can trust enough to put authority in. Now, it then tells you that as the church of Jesus, what we must pursue now is the authority. Have you realized that at every appearing of the Lord, the Bible tells you very clearly that what will precede is John the Baptist? Or the spirit of... Oh, come on, come on, come on. You are Bible students now. Or the spirit of Elijah. What is the spirit of Elijah? You need to understand it. What does the spirit of Elijah do? The Bible tells you very clearly. It turns the heart of the sons to the fathers and the fathers to the sons. What does that mean? God, in establishing that he has a people, establishes it in multiple generations. So why God chose Abraham is that he will instruct. And so until lineages are established in believing God, what happens is that the authority of God is not on the earth. So when God finds a man, listen, after the order of John the Baptist, 
what he uses them to do is he compels an entire generation to start to consider God again and live in his ways. That's what the baptism of John the Baptist did. That's what the sword of Elijah did at the brook. So you find out that in the days of Elijah, there was nothing Elijah declared that didn't come to pass. Because he also is the son of man. And even when Elijah was out of order with the love principle of God, the faith principle of God was sufficient for Elijah. So Elijah would look at the captain of 50 and say, if I be a man of God, let's, let fire fall from heaven. Now, if you check that across the love nature of God, you will find out that's not what God would have done, except that at that point, God has bequeathed authority to a man because he's the son of man. When James was saying, James chapter 5, Elijah was a man subject to like passions like as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it should not rain. You know, the one you read in 1 Kings is that he prayed that rain should return. It is James that told you that before he prayed that rain should return, he had prayed that it should not rain. That means he did not gain authority when rain returned. He gained authority when he stopped the rain from falling. And listen to this. This is going to shock you. Did you hear the effect of having prayer of the righteous are very smart in that scripture in James 5? Listen. Elijah's reason for prayer is not the stopping of the rain. It's the establishing of the will of God. So the whole essence of that story in Elijah was to end the reign of the prophets of Baal in Israel because Baal is God in Israel as long as Israel accepts Baal as God by the principle of God. I'll start again. Baal is God in Israel as long as Israel accepts Baal as God by the principle of God. Because the earth he has given to the sons of men. So when Baal pervades the inheritance of God, what God does is he starts to find a man who seeks him. You remember John chapter 4? For such do the father seek to worship him. So while you thought that you were the one seeking God in worship, what you did not know is that it was him seeking you. And that your worship and your depth of the quest made you attractive to God. So God began to run in your direction, hoping that he can find a man that will agree with him that he is God. When he finds that man, then every display of the power of God comes from that man with the intent to redeem other men. As far as the earth is concerned, man is God. What man agrees for on the earth is what happens on the earth. As far as the earth is concerned, both God and Satan, since the day God gave the earth to man, are tenants here. The landlord here is man. So both God and Satan seek the attention of man so that they can find expression on earth. Are you following me? God, the ultimate owner of the earth who borrowed it to man, will judge man at the end for yielding to Satan or doing the rubbish he did. And yet, until man's cup is full and God is ready to judge, God cannot obstruct what happens on the earth. So the only way God finds expression on the earth is that another man decides that while other men are doing the rubbish they are doing, he will seek God. When that man seeks God, God seeks the man. The moment God seeks the man, what God intends to do is to commit all authority to that man because he is the son of man. Because he's the son of man means he's the only one who has legality to display the authority of God right now. That will then mean that God will rather have man in the power of his might than have man strong in the Lord. Because when man is strong in the power of God's might, God sees a man he can trust. Then he sees a man he can give authority to. That means we will beg at the fringes of the mercy of God and the mercy of God might overrule judgment 
and find a basis in darkness to obstruct the normal operations of God within the present dispensation so that he can have mercy upon us and show us a sign that he hears our prayer. But nothing will change on the earth until we move from being strong in the Lord to being strong in the power of his might. If you are confident you understood the last set of things I said, please say an amen. amen. So God would rather have man strong in the power of his might than have man strong in the Lord. Listen to this very carefully. Even those of you who thought you understood it, listen to it carefully. Because if man is strong in the Lord, the highest that will happen is that man will beg on the fringes of the mercy of God. And if you understand the mercy of God, Jeremiah said it overrules judgment. That means the mercy of God can go beyond what is legal and do something on the earth that man does not qualify for, but the mercy of God decided to do. You remember we had said on Sunday that be strong in the Lord depends on the mercy of God. Be strong in the power of his might depends on the grace of God. And the grace of God is the inworking of the ability of God that is upon a man by reason of a consistent relationship that he has built with God. Are we together? That means that if we do not raise a church, and when I say a church, I'm not talking about an assembly. If we do not raise a church in the earth, that has the stature to understand authority enough to execute authority on the earth on behalf of God, what will happen is that every election we will beg God. And if God, forgive my English, not very accurate, but true. If God decides to have mercy upon us, what he will do is he will have to go and take advantage of certain illegalities of darkness. And upon those illegalities of darkness, overrule the preparedness of the church and bring to pass what will favor the church, even though he knows that if he gives that to an unprepared church, they will damage it. It's like giving a car to an 11-year-old. Before you gave the car, be sure you have called the mechanic because an accident is about to happen. So many times the Lord denies the church what it seeks to provoke the church into stature. Because even if he goes on in his mercy to give us what we seek, the present stature that we bear that is not strong enough to carry that which we are asking for will damage what God gives us. That's why, and that's not going to be our testimony. Not in Plateau State, not in Nigeria, not anymore. Because a church is right. Listen, that's why my heart is broken that the church celebrates the peripheral. Because as long as we celebrate the peripheral, we will not be provoking a generation to enter the depth of the waters to enter stature. And while you are celebrating your peripheral results, what will happen is that the yardstick of God is still in place. While you are celebrating all wives' fables, while you are celebrating Tasunia, you know Tasunia? We, we treat church now like Tasunia, like the essence of the existence of church is to rob our ego and teach us how to succeed in the tiny matters of life. And what is at stake is the authority of the earth. A generation that is provoked enough must arise. If not, like Elijah, some of us might have to stand in front of Horeb and say, I, only I am left. You know, that's a very pompous, proud statement. Do you understand it? When Elijah said, only I, it's a very pompous statement. That's why it was God who told him, I have 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to bow. So that you understand that I only I is not I only I. But what is 7,000 in the population of Israel? That's why the Bible warns you that it's only a remnant that will be saved. Leave the matter out. A great falling away is coming. And we're still teaching the Christian faith and our Christian work as though it is bread and butter for everyday living. It's a generation that will push back darkness God is looking for. We are still discussing who offended who and how they, will they settle. Sometimes, when I watch our celebrated meetings, it used to do me like, you know how your grandmother will sit down under the tree in the village? The whole of you gather. Then she start telling one story of one cock and bull. And I'm not saying our gatherings are cock and bulls. No, I'm just saying, for those of us who have been granted access to see what lies ahead, we are looking at what is now. And our hearts are quaking. 
Because sometimes we are, we are reading the things the Lord Jesus said. He said if the days were not certain, even the very elect will be deceived. I didn't say all of that to scare you. I said that to say to you, this matter of be strong in the power of his might, we are past the place where it is an option. We are beginning to approach the place where it is the only means of survival. So hear this. And don't indict me for it. When I say these things, I speak, let me say like, like, like Paul, I speak as unto my children. So that, please remove me from all the public arguments. I'm not in that space. I speak as unto my children. The days are coming and they are not too far. When only those who are strong in the Lord will stand. The injunction in that scripture is take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That means if you have not arrived at the power of his might, the tendency is that the darkness coming will swallow you. Is it making sense? Listen, that's why I want to beg you before camp meeting comes. Decide that there are certain civilian affairs that will not hold you. Any man that wore it does not entangle himself with civilian affairs. Decide now that some civilian affairs will not hold you. We are past the place where be strong in the power of his might is a choice. It will soon become the only means for survival. So listen to this carefully. Back again in John chapter 5, scripture now said, and the father has committed all judgment to the son because he is the son of man. If you are here on Sunday, I quoted Psalm 149 from verse 6, let the high praise of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword where in their hands to execute what? Vengeance upon the hidden and judgment upon to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. He said, this honor has all the saints of God. Go back, go back, go back. Verse 6. 6, 6, 6, 6, 6. 149 verse 6. Let the high praises of God where? Be in their mouth and what? What is a two-edged sword? That one does not, you don't need mystery. Is what? The word of God. That means it has to be a generation that has mastered the word or the principles of God. People always speak the high praises here. We forget that there's a double-edged sword. And I hope you know that the high praises was not just talking about singing in the service. It's speaking about exalting the Lord into the highest place in your thinking. Exalting him enough to not exalt any idol or principle above the recommendation of God. So, let the high praise of God be in their mouth. And what? A two-headed sword where? In their hands. When you find that generation, what do you find? A generation that executes vengeance upon... Stop. Vengeance upon who? The hidden or the Gentile nations or the unbelieving nations. That means God has, he said the wrath of God is coming upon all the ungodliness of men which they have ungodly committed from their ungodliness. That's how Paul puts it. That means that God has borne with much patience the principles by which the ungodly live. But God is not about to do anything about it. Who is supposed to execute vengeance? Help me, help me. Who is supposed to execute the vengeance? And punishments upon the people. That's sanctions. Next verse. Verse 8, look at this. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with what? That means that there's a rulership system that has made the world go on in darkness the way it is going. That means you are the one who was supposed to be designed to change who kings are. Whether in physical thrones or in exalted minds. Because kingship is not only in physical thrones. Um, the Old Testament shows us very clearly that one man can sit on the throne and another man sit in the mind of the man on the throne and the mind of the people. And another man can be godly or ungodly. One godly man, Joseph. Another one, Daniel. One ungodly man. Eh? Somebody said I hit over. Hey, somebody called the name I was looking for. Haman! Haman had Zaxis Mumu button like this. To the degree to which 
after Mordecai had seen Haman hung upon, they could not undo the law that Haman put in place. The best they could do was establish another law that gave Israel the right to defend themselves. In fact, the story of the contest between Haman and Mordecai shows you the kind of contention that must happen before judgment is executed. I say this and I maintain that I'm guilty about it. And the Lord needs to heal me and heal many others from our pride. Please forgive me. Listen to me very carefully. And our pride is not baseless. Our pride has got a basis. Our pride is the fact that before now, many prophets and, and, and many prophets and priests who have hung around kings have hung around them begging for what to eat. So many of us who have decided to stand in truth and integrity had to keep ourselves far from kings so that the kings do not look at us and think of us like the rest of the priests and the prophets who are hang around them for daily bread. Now, this is the reason why I'm making that statement. The pride of it is the fact that those whose consecrations are clean and whose hearts are pure and whose intelligences and principles by the word of God are straight, many times will not hang around kings enough to give them wisdom. They will lead charlatans to hang around them. And when charlatans hang around them, a king is likely going to use the solution anybody gives him in the time of his distress. And that man is not only a solution bringer, he creates room for himself in the heart of the king. It's part of the reasons why many of us who are believers must push our pride aside and find a way to arrive at accepting the call to sit around kings and princes. Did you notice that by the time Adonijah was trying to take the kingdom, just before Nathan and Bathsheba made the plan to go and speak to David, there was another priest who was there with Adonijah and another priest in the palace, apart from Nathan, the prophet. That means that part of the reasons why David succeeded was that he was surrounded with priests and prophets. I hope you know that what I said about pride now had nothing to do with me. If you understand what I mean. I'm talking to you. I'm saying to you, don't look at us. Keep ourselves far because we want to keep a consecration. Then you too get an opportunity to get close to a king. Then you keep yourself far because you copied our pride. Oh, I wish you heard me. That's what I meant by what I said had nothing to do with me. I said it so that you know that if God grants you access to kings and rulers, take it. Don't only take it and sit down there and be waiting for the food on the table. Take it waiting for the days of trouble. Take it praying in the spirit. Take it understanding what it takes to rule nations. Take it bringing answers in the day the king is in trouble. Take it knowing that if you don't take that space in the mind of the king, some charlatan will take it. One of the problems we have is how to maintain a consecration and yet maintain relevance. Especially the church in the north. We have a lot of that problem. We can easily accuse the church in the south and tell them, you put out consecration, you compromise everything. But they are always around things that are relevant. Uh, do you understand it? <laughs> and it's not a call to exalt relevance above consecration. It's a call for the consecrated to understand that the essence of consecration is relevance. Please give back that scripture in Psalm 149. Are you getting blessed? Let the high praise of God be in their mouth, a two-edged sword in their hand. Next verse to execute vengeance against the hidden and punishments upon the people to bind their kings with chains and to bind their nobles with fetters of iron, verse 9. And I think that would be to execute upon them what? Oh, what did we just read in John chapter 5? And had committed all judgment to the son. Why? So what did John chapter 5 tell you? And had committed all judgment. The father, as the father had life in himself, so had he given to the son to have life in himself. And because now the son has life in himself, the father has committed how many judgments? 
all judgments into the hand of the son. Why? Because the son is the son of man. That means it is going to take sons of men to execute. Oh, take you back to Psalm 40, uh, 149 so that you see. This honor has all the angels of God. No, this honor has all the angels of God. To execute upon them the judgment routine, this honor have all his saints. Now understand that this is the central reason for sainthood. This is the central reason for sonship. It's the central reason for stature. So scripture said, be strong in the Lord and be strong in the power of his might. I was speaking to you about the spirit of Elijah. You still remember? Come on, come on. Do you still remember? So what happened with the spirit of Elijah, which they went on to say, don't rest now upon Elisha. Listen to this very carefully. Is that in the days of Elijah, what he declares comes to pass the way he declares it. That means that authority is given to him. Now, I, I will need to pass by a scripture in Second Peter chapter 1 very quickly. Maybe we should go straight to verse 11. But no, let's, let's take it from verse 3. By his divine power, he had given unto us all things. I, I'm thinking that media should hurry up and get there. That pertains to what? Life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him that called us to what? Our calling is so that we can arrive at glory and goodness. Or glory and good works. Glory being the form, virtue being the actions. And let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works. Glorify your Father in heaven. Who had called us to glory and virtue. That means the essence of every promise God has ever given is to bring you to a stature so that you can do good works. Next verse will say, whereby given unto us exceeding great and precious promises so that by all of these promises, we might become what? Oh, no, 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 no. You are not talking to me. That you might become what? Maybe I should take particles of divine nature to become strong in the power of his might. Ah, 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 ah. It's coming alive now. That's, that's what I thought will happen in your mind when you heard it. Partakers of divine nature simply means that as God is, we, we begin to become like that. What do we say about the power of his might? That when we're strong in the Lord, he did for us. When we became strong in the power of his might, we learned of him. Take my yoke upon you and for I am and a meek and lowly heart is not the reason why you should take, it's not, it's not so that I can allow you to take my yoke. A meek and lowly heart is what you become when you take my yoke. A meek and lowly heart is what you become when you take my yoke upon you. That's what brings you to finding rest for your soul. An active soul is a product of feeling responsible for the things that God should have handled. And an active soul is a soul that does not know rest. You, you are calculating your way through. You are not obeying your way through. Recently, I've been realizing how precious it is to just obey. The old songwriter said, when we walk with the Lord, in the light of his, what a, he, honor, uh -huh, while we, he, and, then what do you say in the chorus? Uh -huh. uh -huh. That means you can be in Jesus and not be happy. Why? Because you are walking your way through. You are not trusting and obeying. It should be sufficient for you that you are standing in the center of the will of God. Listen, one of the very high blessings I have, that's the farthest I can take it so that my wife does not sack me. She has warned me not to say beyond that. One of the highest blessings I have is that in my seasons of my highest contentions, the Lord shows up to tell me, that you are, you are standing right where I want you. 
Reverend Tende did something. Ah, I wish you were all in school of leadership. Reverend Tende read the scripture in Acts chapter 16. I established that it wasn't just in Acts chapter 16, it was also in 2 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 2. When I got to trials, I did not find my, my brother Titus, and so I didn't have rest. And even though God ministered at the virtual door, we went on. Do you understand it? Now listen to this. You'll find out that in Acts chapter 16, before Paul had the vision, Pastor Nde said something very powerful. He kept walking and trying. Then he got to the place and found restraint and got to the next place. And even though the door was open, but you know, there was Satan resisted us. Then, then in the night, I saw a man from Macedonia. That means that when God sees a man exerting his soul in truth, in an attempt to find the purposes of God, he sends you a vision. When it's a vision, it is no longer an impulse. It's not an inner witness. I agree with him a hundred percent that God speaks to you 97 percent of the times. But in the seasons of deep contention, you are going to require visions. That's why you notice that with Joseph, the husband of Mary, the father of Jesus, he didn't respond. It's not by inner witness. What was at stake was to If he made a mistake of sleeping in Bethlehem one more night. That's God Almighty. I'm telling you, he has given the earth to the sons of men. God told Joseph, run. Herod seeks the man's life. I thought that the Almighty God should kill Herod. But the earth has he given. So God came back to him in a dream and said to him, Arise, take the child and go back. He said, For those who seek to kill him, are now dead. You know where Joseph used inner witness? When he returned, the Bible says, Joseph looked at Bethlehem and he was not, even though God told him, Those who seek are dead. He said, I beg, so that nothing bad will happen. Let me take this boy to Nazareth. Then Matthew said, That it might be fulfilled. That means Joseph didn't have a direct instruction or a revelation or an appearance in the night that said, take this child to Nazareth. But by the inner impulse, he said to himself, if we go back to Bethlehem where they were seeking him, they might easily trace because he will be the only age mate he has. He said, let's take him to Nazareth. And he didn't say, let's take him to Nazareth because the prophet said, no, it was Matthew looking at it in retrospect that saw that that deep inner witness. But when the things were at stake, it was not inner witness God used. Like, arise, Joseph. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. That one cannot be inner witness. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? But when the Lord sees you pressing consistently, in the direction of exerting your soul only upon the clarity of what will you have me do? You provoke the divine. The Lord shows up. He shows up. He shows up to console you. He shows up to bring you to rest. He shows up to make you happy again. It is in that place that you shouldn't see visions every night. You understand it? You shouldn't hear audible voices every day. But when things are at stake, don't exert your soul in finding solution. Exert your soul in seeking him. You will provoke an appearing. So, when they were in the shipwreck, Paul didn't say, and the Lord witnessed in my heart that none shall die. He said, there stood by me last night an angel of the Lord, whose I am and whom I serve. That one was a direct appearance. Listen, let the foolish not hear this and say, I contradicted Pastor Tende's message. No, I am telling you that the 5% he spoke to you about, which is the 5% rarities of time, that means if you never arrive at deep contention, you might never need such a strong witness. When you arrive at deep contention, 
and your soul quakes within you. How you know that you are not exerting your soul in the work of finding solutions? Because by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your soul already feels abandoned by God. So the moment he finds the circumstance in front of it, he starts to work out solutions. You find out that there are great achievers who don't have peace. Great achievers who don't know what it means to be happy. They have scarred their soul too much in exerting it in the direction of finding solution. So even though they are standing there and their empire is large, there's too many scars in their soul. Your success will not scar your soul. Amen. Oh, I wish somebody said a better amen. amen. You will arrive at the glory of the Lord, but you will arrive at it intact in the name of Jesus. No compromise. Not, nothing harming your conscience. The Lord himself protects your conscience. Keeps it tender. Teaches your heart to look up in the days of your pressure so that you do not look to the left or to the right and damage your inner man in the name of jesus so let's teach this are you getting blessed it's important to understand it so when elijah finished dodging and then they told him that jezebel was still alive kai you, do you remember you will have simply said, the God who killed your prophets is coming for your neck. But there's a point you get to in seeking the appearing of the kingdom of God on the earth. That you exerted your last energy at the brook. And by the time you heard Israel shouting, the Lord, he is God. And you know the short form of that. The Lord is God. It's Elijah. And Zah. Jehovah is the Lord. El is God. So Elijah was born to see Israel declare that the Lord is God. After such a mighty roar and a mighty victory, many times there's not an ounce of strength left in your soul for one more battle. Uh, Sila, somebody needed that one. Let me get out of there. Are you following me? So, the execution of judgment is with the Son of Man. That's why we took this long route. Why? Because he's the Son of Man. Why? Because the earth is given to the sons of men. That means God legally will not obstruct this realm until he finds men. But hear this. This is the bit I felt I must teach. That's why I had to fix this extra class. Now notice. In be strong in the power of his might. That's when we arrived in verse 6. And he said above all. Taking up the shield of faith. With which you will quench every fiery dart of the devil. Now I am concerned about the word above all. Are you following me? It means that in all of these elements that make you strong in the power of his might, this is about the most important for me. That's what Paul said. Right? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Is that correct? So above all, taking up the shield of faith with which you'll do what? Quench every fire that of the enemy. I need to say something here, and I hope you can. You realize that the Bible says all flesh is grass. And if all flesh is grass, it means that if that fire that is on that dart hits you, you are going to eat will burn. That means you cannot underestimate the advantage that the flesh seeks. Aye. All right? Do you remember that in the wilderness camp here? Do you remember that the Bible said that the word of God, which was going to be the next element in this armor, did not profit them? Because it was not mixed with. That means if the shield of faith is not intact, the sword of the spirit is useless. So the word that was sent to them 
did not profit them as Nashak. Not because the word was ineffective in itself. Because the character of the word, like I've always thought, Isaiah 55, so shall my word be that proceeds out of my mouth. It shall not return to me for it, but it shall accomplish that which I sent it, and it will prosper in the thing. That means that the release of the word comes with the full power for accomplishment. But the absence of the shield of faith can destroy the power of the word to work and nullify it. And even though the word will not return void, that word will have to wait for another generation that will believe it. That's how powerful faith is. You need to understand it. He said the same word spoken unto us is the same word spoken unto them. But that word did not profit them because they did not mix it with faith. Don't forget that um, Hebrews 11 told you that without faith, it is impossible. That means a pleasing people to God is not a sordid people, it's a shielded people. Miss Solomon, the sword can activate you now and get to do what it was born to do right now. But that shield, if it's not in place, what it will do is that every time the word comes, the fiery that will follow the word, it will stir up your flesh, you will interpret the word on the basis of personal advantage. The moment you do, the power of the word dies. That's why, you remember the story I gave you about Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, that he came to the land of the promise. And he was standing in front of the land of the promise. And God said to him, this is the land I promised you. And God didn't tell him when he was telling him, leave your father's house, that your generation and the fourth generation were going to captivity. God waited until Abraham was standing in front of the land of promise. Then God said to him, your generation will go to captivity. And it will happen in your fourth generation. That's the first generation that you have not yet born. Oh. Because it was that night him and God were discussing, I'm your shield. God said to him, I'm your shield. And you're exceeding great reward. God said to God, what will you give me? Seeing that I go childless, and it is this Eliezer of Damascus that's God said to inherit my house. God said to him, no, no, no. One out of your loins will inherit you. And that not Ishmael, I will give you a seed. That was the day they had this conversation. Seed, where you never collect. They have now told you that the fourth generation of that seed will enter captivity. And that it will enter captivity for three years. It will enter captivity for 400 years. Then after 400 years, I'll raise a deliverer. Then I will bring them back to this land so that they can possess it. And Abraham was not offended with God. The reason is because God had to wait until Abraham had arrived at the place where he was now dead in his flesh. It's Romans chapter 4 that helps you understand it. Because if Abraham was alive in his flesh, there was no promise in that engagement, Abraham should have been offended. That means the moment flesh is still alive, faith dies. Why? Because every word that comes from the Lord will not be interpreted in the standpoint of the advantage of the advancement of the kingdom. It will be interpreted in this, from the standpoint of personal advantage. I will show you tonight why we heal the sick so that our ministry will grow. My friend Pastor Francis called me this afternoon and shared with me a great testimony. I will spare you the testimony. Don't worry. Great, mighty testimony. And I said to my wife, I said, these are the testimonies that when a pastor hears, he forces the person who shared the testimony to come to his church. Because the person that shared the testimony shared Tim Bauchi. I didn't hear it. Over a month ago. I said, I would have forced the person to come to our church. So when he says it, they will know that the angel of my anointing is strong. And in the last two months, he's the fourth person having that kind of encounter. And God decides to show up with my face to people who have never met me. Do you understand Leave it. That's not, that's not destiny. If I tell you testimony, you not sit down. Leave it. Do you understand it? Then I realized that part of the things that keep destroying us is that we pursue the things that look like they have our advantage tied to them. And what we did not know was that we empowered the fiery dart. How? The Bible told you about the Bible told you about the children of Israel. And he told you how they killed the word of faith and killed the promise even though they entered the land. Because God had to be faithful to Abraham 
So they entered the land, but they did not enter the promise. I hope you know that. They didn't enter the promise. The promise they didn't enter is what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11. We are, we are still waiting for. And the person who reverted the promise was David. And he reverted it in Psalm 32 when he said, Now arise, O Lord. Come to your rest, you and the ark of your might. Then God hoped again. No, God did not rest, though. He just hoped. Because the David who stirred up the hope of God by presenting to God the manner of man in a measure that God wanted to see had come out of his warfare only to raise his children in comfort so that the most responsible child of David was Solomon. You didn't hear me. You did not hear me. The most responsible child of David was Solomon. With all the madness Solomon did among the children of David. And David knew it before he died. That's why he got up from his sick bed and anointed Solomon before Adonijah will kill Israel. Go and check the boys, David Gibbet. From Absalom to Amnon to Adonijah to Solomon. My prayer every time is that a subsequent generation understands the labors that broke open the pathways by which their fathers found God. Because if they found the comfort of being around the God of their fathers, when they are seeing the outcomes, not seeing the labors, they will end up being mad like the children of David. That's the reason why the day I was ordaining Pastor Ogebe here, I told you, outstandingly, one of the definite proofs that the hand of the Lord is upon him is that he has raised three generations in faith while he's alive. <laughs> it's not a joke. Those are things to go and sit down under. I told Pastor, hey, I've decided all the young men in church, all the men, the men's group will be under Pastor Ogebe. Go and sit down there and learn. Because... You don't know what it takes to sustain a revival. It was the hope of God, David's dead. So Paul said in Hebrews chapter 4, God reserved another day in David saying today. That means it was when David said what he said, that God said, who is that? Didn't they tell this guy that I swore in my anger? God swore in his anger, they will not enter my rest. David swore! you will rest. You don't know how it amazes me that the oath of David canceled the oath of God. God swore they will not enter my rest. David got up generations later and saw why Israel was still wallowing in their humanity and fall. Then he swore my eyelids will not sleep until I build a resting place for God. God saw the man. God said, who is that? I, I imagine how the servo of the sacrifice of David came up before God. And I'm not talking of the day when David laid animals on the altar. I'm talking of the day when David's heart said, how can I live in palatial houses and the ark of the Lord is looking for a place to rest? My eyes will know no sleep. I will not sleep upon my palatial bed until I find the rest, I will find the resting place of God. He wrote the song of the entrance of the ark. Now arise, O Lord. Come to your resting place. You and the ark of your might. That's when God got up. And he said, today, if you will hear my voice, don't repeat what they did in the wilderness. David healed the heart of God and told God, hope again. I will say the weight will not leave you. He told God, hope again. Chintok is coming. You are a wise daughter. That God should not worry. There will be a generation that in them will be no rebellion. In them, obedience will be perfected. In them, there will not be the elements of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil competing night and day with the destinations of God. In them will be a yielded people who will understand what God means every time he sets out in his purpose. In them will be the joy to hear the Lord dance again in the camp. In them will be the sound of rejoicing. In them. God hoped again because he saw David. So every time, every time I stumble, 
What kills me is I'm saying, Lord, how long will it take before you will rest? Because Isaiah 66, you know, that's when God said through Isaiah, the heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. He said, where is the house you have made for me? And where is the place of my rest? Says the Lord. He says, for all these things that you call the place of my rest, hath my hand made. And these things existed before you came. That means if this is my rest, then I will not wait for you to come. There were more magnificent temples before you were born. Silver and gold was on ground before you were born. Then he said, but to this man will I look. That means the rest of God is man. And what it means for God to rest is for him to find a man he can fully incarnate so that the man can live in the power of his mind. That's the rest of God. That's what God has been looking for from generation to generation. So the highest pleasure of God is that a man arises by faith to know God first then to display him. Not because I will show you that there's a faith that does not work by love. The faith that works by love begins with knowing God. That's why Jesus said this is life eternal. To know him. The one true God. And to know Jesus whom he has sent. To know there is not to be informed about. Is to be intertwined with. Is to intercourse with. Is to become one with. The mistake you made from Sunday school was that every time you recited John 3.16, you read eternal life as heaven. The essence of the lifting of the serpent in the wilderness is so that man will have eternal life. That's what Jesus said in John 3.13. He said, for as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Then he said, for God so loved the world. Eternal life is not life in heaven. Eternal life is to know him. Jesus obstructed his prayer in John 17 to explain eternal life. That's not the way Jesus should have prayed. Put John 17 on the board so that they can see it. It was prayer. Jesus was praying John 17. Look at it. Put John 17 on the board. John 17 from verse 1. This word spread Jesus and what? Lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, what? That means he just began to do what? He just started praying. The hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. Verse 2. As you have given him power over all flesh that he should give to as many as thou givest him. Then Jesus was explaining to the father. And this is eternal life. Was it the father he was actually explaining to? He knew that while he stood there in Gethsemane. John and the rest of the guys were hanging around. And hearing the prayer. So he obstructed his prayer. And laid an explanation. So that you are not confused as to what eternal life is. Because even in their days as Jews, and they had a leaning towards a pharisaical sect, the leaning is the thought that eternal life means life after death. Eternal life does not start when you die. Eternal life is now to know him, the one through God. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Then the next thing he said is... I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. That means, what is the work you gave me to do? That I should give eternal life to as many as believe. So if I say, I have finished the work you have given me to do, I'm not just saying I've healed the sick and I've raised the dead. So in healing the sick and raising the dead was not only the desire to fix what is broken. It was also above the desire to fix what is broken was the need to show an example to those who will inherit eternal life as to what a man will look like when he has eternal life. And to live eternal life God save my soul I want to live eternal life 
find it. I think it should be on my pages. Esther, we uploaded that. Esther, is it is on the page? Eternal life. Serpent for serpent. Humanity for humanity. Please go and listen. Because the brazen serpent was not only Jesus crucified. The brazen serpent was Jesus perfected. Listen to us. It was fiery serpents that were bite, biting them. Uh, oh, take up the shield of faith with which you quench it was the Bible called them fiery serpents. It was fiery serpents that were biting them. Because that entire picture was going to be the picture of faith. That's why Hebrews chapter 12 told you that this is the order of faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of what? Now, brass is significant. Please go and listen to that message. You will remember that in the New Testament, the only significance of brass you have in the New Testament was the feet of Jesus in the coals of heaven. John said, I saw his feet. They were like burnished brass, consistently being refined. That means that corruption could not rest upon him, not because he was refined, but because he was still in fire. Are you following me? Humanity makes that every time you go and interact with dust, you return for a washing. But the Lord Jesus, in that perfected state, is not going to interact with dust and coming back to be washed. In that perfected state, his feet is walking the coals of fire or heaven and they look like burnished brass. And God said to Moses, make a serpent of pure brass and hang it. Whoever the fiery serpent bites, if he looks at the brazen serpent, that means whoever is caught up by the weakness of humanity, if he looks at the perfected man, the venom of humanity drains out of his body. He escapes the corruption that is in the world. So you don't escape the corruption in the world by trying. You escape the corruption in the world by beholding. The theme of that conference was look and leave. You don't escape the corruption of humanity by trying. You escape it by beholding. If you see the way he escaped it, the power of the venom will leave your body. Oh, I wish you heard me. That means to kill mortality is to fix my eyes on Jesus. So as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, it was serpent that beat them, it was serpent raised. Jesus is no serpent. Jesus is the son of man. That means every time humanity bites you, every time the weakness of falling flesh bites you, you look at the man who is perfected. The moment you see him, the effect, even the venom of it, its power to kill you will lose effect. Because as you behold us in a glass, the glory, you are changed. That's what he meant when he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of what? Don't forget what we're talking about is above all, taking the shield of faith. With which you quench every fiery dart. It's a shield of faith. It's a shield of faith. So understand that faith is not supposed to be exactive upon outcome. 
is supposed to be exactive upon God. Please follow me. What I said I wanted to show you tonight is the faith that walketh by love. So faith is not supposed to be exactive upon outcome. It's supposed to be exactive upon God. Now, please don't hold this very strictly because I'm going to balance it up later. That means that faith is not that I desire to see an outcome. It is that I know what God's outcome is concerning this circumstance and I will not rest until God's outcome comes to pass. That's what it is. That's the difference between faith and faith that works by love. Every time faith works by love, it is obstructed by the need of another. You understand it? So when I do faith to get outcomes, look for where the need is. It's always on me. Follow me. You to get this. When faith becomes exact, exactive on a subject, listen. There is no exertion of energy that does not have a motive. Sometimes that's why I push for that. Maybe you'll find your answer. Every exertion of energy, if you probe it, you'll find its motive. Are you following me? No exertion of energy is motiveless. And faith, the law of faith is exertion. It's in Mark 11. Give Mark 11. Give Mark 11, 20. And in the morning, as they passed by, now this was after Jesus caused the fig tree. Do you remember? Good. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Next verse. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto Jesus, Master! What? Behold, the fig tree you caused! Ah. You need to add the emotion to what Peter said. How many of you think Peter came and said, Master, excuse me, sir. Now, I just wanted you to know that the fig tree you cost. That means they were wild. Like, my God. Now, don't forget that the timing, it wasn't only that Jesus cost the fig tree. The timing between when they left and when they came to find the tree with that, was not even humanly comprehensible as to the fact that a living tree will have withered to that degree. I just cut down a few mango trees in my house. This is like four days. Now, this may be like a week since they came down. It is as they came down that the fruit was ripening on the ground. You know if you eat that, that's poison. Because it wasn't ripe on the tree. <laughs> okay, sorry. I didn't come for mango story here. If you grew up in the barracks like me, you know the kind of ma red mango you should not eat. <laughs> so, listen. The tree is still alive. I looked at it today and it was, it's green. I'm talking about a tree cost. A, a, a tree cut down. This one, they didn't cut it down. Jesus said, cost are you. Now, you need to understand that the basis for that cost, now because many people always ask that question. The basis for that cost was not the hunger of Jesus. It was the green leaves on the tree. Why? Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And whose trust the Lord is. Go on, go on, go on. Come on, and come on. You know the Bible now. So go on. For he will be like a tree. Uh -huh, planted by the rivers. Uh -huh. He sets its roots. By. He said it will not. Be weary in the year of drought, neither will it cease to yield its fruits, and its leaves will be evergreen. That means there is a placement that defies the law of times and seasons. And how we know that you have been placed in a placement that defies the law of time and season? Is that your leaf is evergreen. I 
come again. You didn't get that. Did you get that scripture? That's Jeremiah 17. Blessed is the man. Now, I hope you know that the miracles of Jesus were majorly instructive. And they were not about the circumstances, they were about the people who needed to learn the lessons. But let's go. Blessed is the man that trusts the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Why? That means other trees are planted where they are planted. They depend on rain. This one is planted where? And it spreads out by the and it shall not see when it comes but and shall not neither shall so even though it was not the time for figs that Jesus saw that the leaves were green meant that it had roots that touched the river that means that the law of seasonal fruiting blessed are those who dwell in his house they will continually be praising him that means you don't have seasons for yielding fruit are you following me? your fruit cannot be seasonal There's no season God passes by your life and says, well, this is a tough season for you. And because it's a tough season, let's spare you from yielding fruit. A curse is waiting for you. So Jesus expecting to find figs. When he did not see figs, cursed the tree. He said, let no man eat of you all the days of your life. And walks away. Now by the time they were returning that way, it was incomprehensible not only that it's that the tree had withered so imagine that Peter went to decide to peace that's when he saw the tree he might not have gone to peace they might have been the ones checking notice that the man who actually works in faith does not go back to check outcomes Jesus didn't tell them, have you seen that tree? <laughs> the one I cursed. He must have been the disciples who heard him curse it. Then when they were passing back, just imagine it, that Peter went to peace. And was just standing, he now saw the tree. He couldn't wait for the peace to finish. Master! And everybody stopped in the journey. He said, Master! <laughs> Master, did that tree you cursed? my god my god i brought you the back of the tree look at it is finished listen <laughs> you thought jesus would say to them people are still playing with me you don't know who i am you're not celebrating grace you face disgrace <laughs> What Jesus answered and said is the King James said have faith in God the literal Hebrew says have the God kind of faith two things he says here that means number one God lives out faith that's how he does everything the only way man can please him is to live out faith. But it also suggests that there are there is a walking of faith that is not the God kind. Now let me say something that will shock you. The next thing Jesus said was not the God kind of faith, it was the faith principle. He walks whether for the God kind or for the other kind. I will show you both kinds. Are you alive? Come on, come on, saints. Are you alive? Andrew, are we still together? He said, For verily I say unto you, that 
whosoever take note whosoever shall say to this mountain be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea condition and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he shall come to pass he shall whatever he says this law is the law of faith this is a, so if I stay believing and not doubting in my heart I arrive at the place where I generate sufficient energy to change the circumstance when prof was teaching here last week he said if you ignore spirituality and African spiritism you will do it at your own detriment but then he took the time to tell you what Isaiah already told you in scripture Jeremiah also told you that the foolishness of idols is this that a skilled woodman will enter the bush cut wood then choose the fine part that will not rot in then he will carve an image out of that fine part that will not rot in then he will keep that thing on a platform and say you are my god you made me you did not hear you did not hear that means it was your wisdom that created that god that he's not rotting you made it then set it on an altar and said thou art my god thou createst me now but listen to what happens in the spirit the moment a man alludes to that the power of faith which is the energy that controls his life moves from the man and enters into the thing and so the man begins to study the thing according to the patterns of his life to tell what pleases the thing so if he sits here and he wakes up tomorrow and tomorrow was a bad day what he will say is my god forbids sitting next to him it is irreverence it is now written as a pattern of worship forever everybody who is born by him will not sit here then he out of his human thinking tells himself kai i've not been feeding this my god then he will take a bowl of his food and lay before the god you wake up the next day in the morning the food will rot in but the day will be good then he embraces it as a custom one day he brings the god food that has palm oil inside then the day is bad then he says to himself it must be the palm oil then he tries another food with palm oil and the next day is bad then he writes it in the book of commandments our god hates palm oil now you will laugh at it until i say the next thing the faith that goes into that belief system now makes that for two three generations after if you break any of the codes he has written your life will break because a demonic entity has personalized that idol and has decided to compel the obedience of an entire village from Israel. That's how all the gods of the earth were formed. They were formed by the deception of Satan and the fate of men. So, once you believe a thing consistently and do not doubt it, 
takes on a personality. Receives the power to cause effect. <laughs> That means man without God can change anything. Follow me. Aya. I say it again. That means man without God can do what? If you find that difficult to believe, Genesis chapter 11 will help you. In Genesis chapter 11, God looked down and said, The people is one of one accord. Philippians chapter 2 tells you that, that that means they have one mind. Then God said, and there is nothing they are proposed to do. That that means faith does not require God to walk. That means faith does not require God to walk. Now, the second level of what I'm going to say to you, which will shake you, please forgive me. I'm, I'm not going to dwell there for so long. Number one, faith does not require God to walk. Number two, a man can believe in God and exercise faith without God. Now that's where it becomes dangerous. Because that a man believes in God, he quickly attributes every outcome of his life to God. What he did not know is that he exercised faith that produced him results that were not in the plan of God. So number one, a man does not need to know God to have faith. And whatever man exacts faith towards, he empowers. Because by the foreknowledge and the preordination of God, every man was created with power. In fact, what the Antichrist will take advantage of is the discovery of the resident power in you. That discovery is what he will stir up to create every kind of lying signs and wonders. It is upon the strength of that that the Antichrist will preach freedom from faith in God. You remember that Paul said to the Thessalonians that he will rise up against everything that is called God, not the Christian God. And in the day when he breaks and balkanizes the power of the earth, all he's going to do is he's going to help men self-discover the resident power of faith inside them. So they'll start teaching your children in school how to move that thing without touching it. And everyone in that day will be able to do it. Then they will tell you that that thing you have always called God is you. It's part of the reasons why this faith that we have in God, Kauna, that is based on what God can do for us, will not survive the great falling away. You know this faith that you're angry that what you believe God for didn't come to pass. That faith, that, that thing is an evidence that if a great falling away happens now, you will not stand. I was offended with God. If, I, if, if not for the Holy Spirit that told me one thing. I'm telling you, I wouldn't have come to church. You know, I heard one day when Pastor A was teaching here. Maybe some of you will remember. I wasn't here. But I heard one day when Pastor A was teaching here. That that he's concerned that Christians have gotten used to saying, I'm offended with God. And we're beginning to make it sound like it's normal. I'm not even in that service. Do you remember that service? I was not here, but I watched it. Why? The reason is very simple. This culture of offense with God actually shows you how much of your self-advantage you want to protect. And you remember we said that the fire of the death of Satan is sitting in flesh. All flesh is grass. As long as flesh is that alive, what happens is that the that will burn it. So, first is that faith can walk outside of God. Second, is that a man can have faith and the faith will produce result but it was not by God he produced the result and the deception will sit there that he's approved of God because of his outcomes and he will believe that because they were outcomes of faith Kai, there's a scripture I've been avoiding because I want to use it after I show you the faith that works by love do you realize that there are two scriptures one in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in the introduction of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I think I mentioned this on Sunday. The Bible said, if I have faith that can remove mountains, 
Give me First Corinthians 13 verse 2. Anybody still there? Is anybody still there? Uh -huh. Follow me. Follow me. Hi. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and not Second Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 2, uh -huh. and understand how many mysteries, and all knowledge, and though, so that, stop. Who recommended this kind of faith? The Lord Jesus. It was on the basis of this that I told you that what the Lord Jesus said in Mark chapter 11 was not the God kind of faith. What he recommended is have the God kind of faith, but what he explained afterwards is the law of faith. Because I will also show you that the God kind of faith is always driven by love. A God kind of faith is always even my love so Paul said and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love I am nothing hey hey David notice that all the others he spoke about me being loud me but in when it came to the matter of faith he used faith for self-definition all right then of course you know verse 3 and I'm coming to it when I come to talk about faith that works by love in verse 3 he said and do I bestow how many of my goods to do what feed the poor and do I give my body to be burnt and have not love so the question is if I can give all my goods to the poor and walk out my body until I'm burnt what then is love because if I, can, I can do that and the Bible says and I have not love what then is love I will, I will take you there. Travel with me. Just travel with me gently. The faith that pleases God is the faith that walketh by love. Let's see it. Galatians chapter 6. Give me Galatians chapter 6. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What I'm looking for is supposed to be in verse 7. But let's read from verse 1. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in the fault, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Next verse, verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? No, no. What's the law of Christ? The law of love, please. For every man think of himself to be something when he's nothing. What does he do? He deceives himself. Verse 4. But let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in and not Oh, whoa. That means don't carry the standard of, that God is putting in front of you and use it to judge anybody. Don't hold anybody accountable to the standards God is revealing to you. Verse 5 will help rearrange your, your mind. One, two, three, go. Verse 2. Verse 5. Verse 2. Verse 5. Verse 2. Verse 5. Is it contradictory? Not at all. In verse 2, what he's saying is that when God is done perfecting you, you will feel responsible for others. In verse 5, what he's saying is don't make anybody responsible for yourself. That's the law of love. That when God perfects his workings in you, take responsibility for others. And that responsibility is in the context of verse 1. Restoration, strengthening, re-establishing, redeeming. Not giving laws. Putting standards. That means if you are disappointed that somebody did not do what you expected him to do, you failed in verse 5. So as a matter of expectation, you don't put expectation on anybody. But as a matter of personal responsibility, you expect people to put expectation on you. That's how the love of God works. To understand this, you have to travel to Matthew chapter 5. 
in Matthew chapter 5 you will understand that God seemed to have by the law of love left you no rights and left everybody right over you that means when I live in love everything people do for me is a privilege everything I do for them is their right because what scripture said is oh no man except the unfinishable unpayable debt of love that means when I love you I'm paying the debt when you love me you don't owe me if you don't understand that then you don't understand the basis of God's love follow me I told you that what we are looking for is the faith that walketh by love and this is not a matter this is not ah no this is too hard you know this is the kind of things that Jesus taught that some of the like, hey, who can do this thing it's a hard saying the reason why you think it's a hard saying is because you are not looking from the power of his might if you are looking from the power of his might you understand that that's how God lives when God gives, he gives freely. He gives not of breading, gives not expecting. He permitted Jesus to die, not so that the world will receive him. Until today, a greater percentage of those for whom he died despise him. So the law of love makes that when you give, you give like one who owes. When you receive, you receive like one who is privileged. That means the inner working of the capacity of, love, of the love of God makes that you are supposed to be self-sufficient and self-generating. Not self-sufficient in the sense of self-conceit, but self-sufficient in the sense that if I was the only light of God's love dropped in an environment, if I'm not getting love from anyone, the love that God is generating from within me is sufficient to keep me and bless the world. It's only from that place some of the things I said on Tuesday will make sense to you. You remember what I said on Tuesday, right? How that was because God trusted you. That's why he sent certain people. And every time you feel weighed down by them, don't run to them, run to God. Lord, please show me what you saw concerning me. And show me the grace that you have poured upon me. Because right now it does not feel so. I feel overstretched. Sometimes I want to be loved too. Sometimes I want to be attended to too. Sometimes I want somebody to ask me, how am I doing too? And yet, God expects that I don't carry that about as a right. So, if you ever called me Alade, I said, Daddy, how are you? When I drop the call, I'm grateful to God that somebody rem remembered me. But if I carry my phone and I call you and I say, Alade, how are you doing today? You're in my heart. When I drop the call, I should not feel like you owe me a thank you. I should feel like I've served God. That's a love, love. That's why verse 2 will say, Bear ye one another's burdens. That means if another is burdened, make it your responsibility to carry it. Then three verses later, he said, Carry your own body. Is it settled now? Good. Verse 6. For every man shall bear his own burden. Verse 6. We're almost there. Let him that is taught communicate unto him that in how many things? You owe me. Next verse. <laughs> Be not God for whatsoever a man that also shall he stop. Almost every time you heard this scripture, you heard it in the light of whatsoever. So if I sow corn, I will reap corn. Alright? So those that teach me, if I sow all good things into their lives, I will reap all good things. Sounds very contextual. And it is true. But scripture is not as concerned about what you sow 
as he's concerned about where you sow. Look at this. Because the ru rule is that whatever you sow, you will reap. But where you will sow, you, where you sow, you will, will make that whether you reap eternally or you reap in time. I come again. What you sow, you will reap. You sow kindness, you reap kindness. Right? Sow good, reap good. But where you sow determines whether what you reap is in time or in eternity. See the next verse. For he that soweth to the flesh. Stop. So it did not go on to speak about what you sow. It went on to speak about where you sow. And he showed you that there are only two locations to sow. Flesh and spirit. That means if I do you good, but I do it with the intent so that you believe I am good. I will reap good, but I only reap good in time. Because together with the good I will reap, I will reap corruption. Because where you sow determines the nature you reap. Do you understand it? That means you are not only determining where you reap as for, for how long you reap. The longevity of what you reap. But it also, that means I can sow good and reap good with pride. So the nature that I reaped the good with. Now so you see, my sowing is an act of faith. I believe the word of God. But where I sow, what drove me to sow? Ah, the fruit of is Leave it. That means to sow in the spirit is to be motivated by love. You will see it. But to sow in the spirit is not to close your eyes. To sow in the spirit is not even just to obey what God said to you. Yes, obedience is a measure of love. Because if you love me, you will obey my commandments. That means that the least measure of love you want to have is that the lord instructed me i love the lord so i did it so even if i did not love you it was my love for the lord that constrained me to obey the lord that way i still sowed in the spirit as long as i didn't sow it so that you will give me back later as long as i did not sow it so that i can control your life as long as i did not sow it because i love preeminence Oh, you remember that scripture in Third John, right? Uh -huh. So the faith that walked by love. Okay, follow me. You see. It's scriptures. We are reading scriptures. Is it getting interesting? I know what is happening to you right now. You are wondering how many seeds you sowed that you lost. But hear this. God does never speaks for regret and retrospection. God speaks for obedience. And obedience is always ahead of you. It's not behind you. So the word of the Lord did not come so that you regret all of the good things you did before. And said to yourself, I wish I know what I know now. I'll have sown better. There's a scripture I told you I was avoiding. I've been avoiding it since. Do you realize that Jesus said in that day they will come and the father will say, depart from me you for I knew you not. He called them workers of iniquity. What was their response? Ah, sir, in your name. That means by your power we cast out demons. Yeah, that was the second category I was trying to describe for you. So they believed in God, but they, did, they were not motivated by God. So God said, he, he said, in your name, cast out demons. In your name, we lay the hands upon the sick and they recover. In your name. Then God said to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Because I did not know you. Know you means I did not impregnate you. What you did did not come out of the intercourse between me and you. He said, because I was sick, you did not visit me. Stop. I was in prison, you didn't come. I was naked. That 
means if that thing you did was that important you it, it would have reflected in your compassion towards those in broken states not that Jesus was saying visiting the people in the hostel is more important than casting out demons what he was saying is if you don't have baseline compassion enough to see people in their broken state and it moves you enough to do something about it there is nothing you do as a mighty worker that is registered in the divine is it making sense when you finish galatians chapter 7 galatians 6 sorry galatians 6 thank you for matthew 7 No, what do we stop? Verse. Ah, I have only five minutes to go. For he that soweth to not to the flesh, to what? If ego drives me, I son to my flesh. If advantage drives me, I son to my flesh. If impression drives me. So if I get to you, so that I don't say, even pastor. He that saw it to his flesh shall of his flesh reap caution. But he that saw it shall of this notice is not to his spirit. Can you see? He sows to his flesh, but he sows to the spirit. means when it's the spirit he has no connection to you he has every connection to obedience it's the purpose of God that is the central spiritual place to sow all right shall of the spirit reap we're back there eternal life what is eternal life the knowledge of God ah uh, that means I can give and receive good measure, press down, shaking together, and running over and the knowledge of God. I can give money and receive money because it does not change the law of whatsoever a man sows. You understand it? I can give money and receive money, good measure, press down, shaking together, running over and the knowledge of God. I can give kindness and reap kindness, good measure, press down, shaking together, running over, and reap the knowledge of God. Now, that takes you back to 2 Peter chapter 1, that by these great and precious promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. That means any promise that does not increase your knowledge of God adds to your corruption. Even if the outcomes look like God. Any promise that is fulfilled that does not reveal to you the knowledge of God adds to your corruption. Even if the fulfilled promise looks like God. That's why that same scripture said, having escaped the corruption that is the world to lost. Is it making sense to you? You need to get it. If you get it, you will cleanse your motivation. But you will not only cleanse your motivation, you will fire your motivation until your motivation becomes a platform for faith. Because I will show you why, even if I give my goods to the poor, two things are responsible for it. I can do that with the wrong motive. But the second thing is that love does not meet a need according to its capacity and rests. It meets a need according to its capacities and presses into more because the idea of love is not to meet according to its capacity it is to erase the need so you find out that when Jesus operated love there was nobody's need he met and left unmet he didn't do to the best of his ability that means when you have to love to the best of your ability it is supposed to remain with you a provocation that there was something left undone if not love was not the motivation oh so if you needed 50k and i gave you 5k and i was satisfied that i did my best i also lost my reward
together I'll give you 5k it's supposed to be the prayer Lord please whoever you have ordained to raise the 45k because the idea of love is not for me to do my best the idea of love is to meet the need so if I met a blind man and he needed to cross get off night and I helped him to cross and I walked away feeling like I did good I also lost the love the reason is because after I helped him cross there was supposed to have been left in me a discontent Lord how long shall I meet the blind and help them cross rather than give them sight because if I don't perfect what makes them needy then I have not yet been perfected in love neither will I see them and not help them cross that means that the love of God does not abide in me at all does anyone understand the demand of love now see that my dear So you find out that our humanity brought us to the place where we did not even understand the working of God's love. And because we did not understand the working of God's love, the pomposity of our humanity made that when we did what we could do, we walked away satisfied. While God designed that to be the provocation, you understand it? So when you cannot meet the need completely and you have done what you can do, it should have, having established that the need is genuine, means that well, after you have done what you can do, that's part of the reasons why I set up a church welfare system in this church that will not always give you food. If you ask for food once, twice, the third time, I have told you people in welfare, and please make sure you keep to it. Call the people and ask them, what do you do? Why are you? Because the answer to poverty is the poor have the gospel preached unto them. If the word we are preaching is right, it should make you profit. Yes, so we set up a team called people in business. So it's easy to carry you and inject you there and say, please find something for this brother to do. Find something for this sister to do. Because our love is not complete because we gave you rice. Our love is complete because we made you industrious. Until then, we have not lived in love. Is it making sense? I'm almost finishing now. You'll get it. It's the faith that works by love. And you will find out that there's no way a man arrives at the stature of the faith that works by love that he has not arrived at the power of his might. You'll see it. That the measure of what we have called the power of his might is the faith that works by love so the bible calls love the bond of perfectness he calls love the doorway of being filled with all the fullness of god are you with me he that sweat his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption he said but he that sow it to the spirit shall off the spirit reap what life everlasting or eternal life same words used there and let us not be weary in well-doing why for in due season we shall reap ah, yeah 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 what is he addressing he's still addressing your love life now the tendency is that when you start to live in love and you are doing you will become weary you will literally feel like people are taking then he said we shall reap reap what we will reap the natural fruit of the love that we have sown in kindness in giving and all of that but much more we will reap a nature the divine nature the impartation of the divinity of God the power of his might let us not be weary in well doing for in this season we shall reap if we fail not next verse 
as we have therefore opportunity let us do good to all men especially to those of the household of faith fly back to galatians chapter 5. galatians 5 start from verse 1 it is unto liberty that christ has made you free do not be entangled again to the yoke of slavery verse 2 i speak verse 2 2 2 behold i paul say unto you that if you be circumcised christ shall profit you nothing i'm not going to go into circumcision today for i testify again to every man that is circumcised that is a dead thought to how much the whole law to do the whole law christ is become of no effect to you whosoever you are if you are justified by the law you are falling from grace that means if you achieve anything in god by effort you have as you have you are falling from grace that you must look at everything in your life and attribute it to the grace of god the ability that god injected into you the power of his might everything in your life must be attributed to the strength of the lord or the power of his might anything else is sin next verse five for we through the spirit do what wait for the hope of righteousness uh-huh by faith give me verse six for in jesus christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor circumcision but That means as far as God is concerned, he's not looking at all your externals. The only thing that counts to God is the faith that works by love. I wish we could read the entire chapter. If you read the entire chapter, give me verse 7. 7, 8, 9. And then I, you did wrong when? Who did hinder you? That you should not obey the truth. Verse 8. 8, quickly. This passation comment not of him that called you. Verse 9. A little living living at the whole long i hope you know it's still addressing galatians chapter three. Oh, you foolish galatians all right that means somebody began to pump your mind towards the dimension of effort then you stop waiting upon the grace of god now if you run that down i have confidence in you through the lord that you will be none otherwise minded by the time you arrive at go to verse 16 let me cut this short 16 17 16 16 stay at 16 16 this i say then what and for the flesh lusted against the spirit. Next verse, next verse, next verse. For the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are so that you cannot do the things you would. Next verse. But you are not. What does it mean to be led of the spirit? Verse 19. Now the. Stop. He used the word works for flesh effort then you go to verse 22 he used the word fruit for spirit and he told you that love is the fruit of the spirit so when he said walk in the spirit what he was saying is walk in love and if you walk in love what will come out of you will be fruit if you walk in the flesh what will come out of you is effort So listen, what God is looking for in the generation that will gain the stature to finish the times is the faith that is not motivated by results, that's not motivated by self, it's not motivated by the need for preeminence, it's not motivated by the need to be exalted. It's the faith whose motivation is love. But it must also be a love that is strong enough in motivation to never rest until that which it desires comes to pass oh i wish you heard me i've explained both tonight what god is looking for is a faith that is motivated by love but the kind of love that will arrive at faith because faith requires the energy of focus that cancels all doubt you remember the law of faith mark 11 requires the energy of focus that cancels all doubt that means that the love of Christ that is in your heart must become strong enough to generate sufficient zeal and energy that will not stop until what it desires to see comes to pass. So Lord, we will not stop until the city of Joss has no poor person. Do you understand it? That one is not Lord exalt us. We are not even as concerned as being the ones who feed the city as we are concerned about the fact that the poor should not be on our streets lord we will not stop until the feeble knees strengthened lord
Lord, we will not stop until the weak hand is raised. Lord, we will not stop until unemployment is gone. It doesn't matter to us whether we're the ones that created the employment. But we will create the employment. You know why? Because there's no way we can exert the energy of faith in love that way. And God will not generate by us the answers of the things we hope for. One of the quickest ways to arrive at results is to permit love to become an overwhelming and eating up passion. So that you sit down night and day and you are not able to rest because you are in love. Those of you who know, know that I left social media completely recently. And Esther asked me today, she said, Sir, why do you leave? I said, I can't bear seeing a generation just hanging on the things that are very feral. And I know the storms that are coming. I can't bear it. I left so that I can gain back my sanity. Because I know that the things that we are exalting do not have the strength to help us cross the finishing line. If it was not love driven, I will rejoice at the fact that I have found a safe heaven and I'm building by that which is safe. But because it is love driven, it will not rest until a generation rises above the waters and begins to see from where God sees. When you arrive at that realm of love, because God will start by testing it out with your brothers. You will not rest until your brother's burden is out. Whether it is a natural burden, a physical burden, a financial burden, a burden of sin, you will pray night and day check on him night and day hold his hand night and day just trying to make sure that he stands maybe it is time for somebody to lift up their voice and say to the Lord Lord grant me the faith that walks by love is the reason why every time Satan wants to try a journey he attacks the love life of people. He causes that we are too hurt to be truly concerned about one another. My God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision. See things like you do. My God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom to know just what to do. My God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision. To see things like you do, my God, I look to you. You're where my help comes. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of the faith, who for the joy set before him. There are outcomes of the faith that works by love. Part of it is that he will commend authority to your hands, the authority to judge said the father judges no man he has committed all judgment to the son because he's the son of man in the day when that authority comes nobody can question it there's a church that requires to enter that authority his coming is preceded every time by the spirit of elijah he said he will sit like a refiner and a purifier of silver he will purge the house of Levi that they might offer an offering acceptable to God. Give me vision to see things like you do. My God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom 
to know just what to do. My God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. My God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom to know just what to do. And I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love. Say that one more time. I will love you, I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. I will love you, Lord, my forever, oh my day. Hallelujah, hallelujah, our God reigns, hallelujah, hallelujah, our God reigns, hallelujah, hallelujah, our God forever all my day. tonight we embrace the faith that walks by love so that we can arrive at the full stature of Christ the son of the living God yet the son of man so we can say like our master as the father has life in himself so has he given to us to have life in ourselves the father judges nothing and has committed all judgment to the son because he's the son of man. Lord, tonight we submit ourselves as sons of men. Perfecting us the faith that walks by love. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availed anything. But faith which walketh by love. We embrace tonight the faith that walks by love. And we trust you to perfect us in these things. Help us bear the right burdens until we arrive at the place where an entrance is committed to us into your kingdom. By these great and precious promises, our Father, we profess we are partakers of your divine nature and we have escaped the corruption that is in the world that walks by lust. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, and the church said,